Emily, I would also suggest too, that you allow some unstructured personal connection time. Some times where they have to get together and they have to figure out, okay, uh, you guys get out of the house and find something to do uh, for the next two hours and figure it out on your own and leave the devices inside and figure it out. Let them grow outside. Let them do something outside. Welcome to the Generation Youth Podcast. I'm your host, James McLamp. And today we're going to dive into a topic that's very timely. It's on the minds of a lot of parents because the summer months are here. The summer months are approaching. And that's really how to help your teenager grow and thrive during this break from school. And I'm excited that my wife, Melissa, is here joining me to share some of these burning questions that our audience has sent us on this topic. And also to share some of the insights on what we did as we were looking at at youth going forward as well as as we were looking with with young people that we were dealing with. So, Melissa, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. I am so excited to be here. And we have some fantastic questions from parents who are eager to make the most of their summer. So let's just jump right in. Let's do it. Our first question comes from Lisa in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she asks, how can I encourage my teenager to stay active and engaged during the summer without making it feel more like schoolwork? Ooh, that's a good question. We don't want them to feel like it's an extension of that. We don't want to feel like they're in summer school. However, some schools do require students to do work. So how do we manage all this? How do we do this? So Lisa, I think the key is to balance structure with freedom. Provide them with some structure so that they are getting the necessary insights they need, but also having freedom just to be a teenager and just to have that unstructured free time. Encourage them to to explore activities that they're really interested in, that they're excited about, that they're interested in. It could be maybe being on a sports team, which is something that, that our children did a lot. They were on summer swim teams. They played summer baseball. Uh, So they were actively doing that, taking up a new hobby, maybe, maybe going into the yard and exploring things, gardening, volunteering in their community. These are all types of things they can do. But they also got to have some time maybe to to read that may have summer reading that they need to do. Uh, We try to make reading fun as much as we could uh, and not make it seem like a boring part of the day or something that was really going to wear them out. You know, we didn't want that to happen to them. We wanted them to realize summer's the time for them to unwind and recharge. So we want to make sure there was downtime, time to visit family uh, and and do those types of things and and go on vacation. But it not be a time that was wasted without something to energize not only uh, their their physical aspect of it, but in, but their mind as well. Is there anything, Melissa, that uh, you did with the kids during the summer? Because when the oldest two were in their this age, I actually was not at home very often, so I don't. I was working at another place. So, what were you doing with them during this time? So, when they were younger, we did the summer workbooks. And mostly I did like those summer workbooks cover various subjects like reading, math, whatever, just to keep their brain remembering what they had learned in the previous school year to prep them for the next one. So I would use it as leverage to do first thing in the morning. And then I would say, okay, if you finish this, we'll go to the pool in the afternoon. You were bribing them with pool activities to get the work done. I was. But they loved going to the pool. So that was, it was quick and easy. They complained, but it still worked. When they got older, especially our youngest now, she has required summer reading. And, Mm -hmm. you know, now it's at the stage where I'm going to have to be like, when, when are we going to do this? Like, here's what we have going on this week. When do you have time to sit down and start reading this book? So and our, I think and our oldest two, we sent to camps during the summer as well to kind of encourage their minds yeah. and stuff. Jacob went to Boy Scout camp where he was working on different merit badges there. So he was engaging. Sarah Beth went to different leadership camps and different curriculum spoke focus camps that were fun for her. Breaks away from home, but also stimulated the mind as well. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake I see parents make is like, providing too many activities or go from camp to camp to camp to camp. And they do need downtime. They don't get that time during the school year, but 
then again, the danger of too much downtime is, like you said before, going to the devices and texting and being on websites. Yeah, so that's, it the, is that's the range. Yeah, it is a balance. Yeah, and that's the danger uh, that I do want to mention on the show is is that it's so easy to let them binge Netflix or be on their devices for extended period of time, and that certainly is is not what we want to do during the summertime. Yeah. Okay. Our second question today comes from Mark in Charleston, South Carolina. He's wondering, what are some ways to help my teenager de- to develop life skills during the summer? And I'm, I'm speculating that what he is talking about on life skills or some of these activities that are going to prepare them for life, adulthood building accomplishment, uh, building confidence and a sense of accomplishment in what they're doing. So I'm speculating that's what he's talking about. So Mark, summer's a perfect time for that because they do not have the rigors of school, the academic stuff. You can look to explore these other types of activities. I grew up on a farm. I had to work a lot during that time. And so I was building life skills, time management, having to get up on my own, you know, working, you know, part-time job, all those types of things. Those are things that that we need to help them work on. Encouraging your team to to take on these responsibilities that promote independence, like like we just talked about. Helping them to find activities that they're responsible for. If you have the opportunity to have a garden or maybe you have animals that 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 you could be have uh, them take responsibility for for an extended period of time. Those are all going to teach them some responsibility during those things. Organizing family events. Uh, Hey, you know, we're going to have a 4th of July neighborhood party. I want you to help me do all the organizing on this. And really, really taking a step back and letting them give more input, not just responding to what you say. That's going to be a hard one because you're going to want to take over and do it all. But again, doing that. Anything that you can think of that, that we did with ours to help build life skills or or you have seen others do that we wish we could have incorporated. Yes. Well, like I volunteered in a hospital in the summer when I uh-huh. was, you know, in high school as part of my volunteer work. So I think summer's a great time for kids to volunteer because it gets them out in the community. The pool that we have been members of for years, they have youth serve as like coaches on the swim mm-hmm. team. And they're paid very, very, very little, but they're learning skills of working with kids, being responsible, getting there on time. I think that was, I think that's such a great idea and it gets them busy um, and out, you know, at the house. So things like that, I think are super important. And when you said volunteering, it made me think of something that we haven't brought up yet. Of course, this is only the second question so far, but that is. Uh, mission trips that we did through church. You organized and led high school girls on mission trips for a week during the summer for many, many, many years. And our children were benefiting that they were able to go as, you know, know, just really as tag-alongs more than anything else. But that taught a lot about responsibility. Those girls that went on those trips, they were responsible Well, you could describe what they did. Well, they went into children's homes and they did activities with the kids in the children's homes to get to know them first. And then we did a concert following all the fun activities. So we built community before we tried to provide a concert experience for them. And it really went over well, all the way around. But Mark, I would encourage you to look for those opportunities to get them out, let them do stuff. Get them out of the house. Get them out of the yard if you can, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and see if they can go and do something in the area. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there. We just have to let them find it and, and give them permission to do it as well. Yes. All right. Our next question comes from Sarah in Virginia. She asks, "Is it beneficial for my teenager to work a summer job, and if so, what should they look for in a job?" Okay. Absolutely. I grew up working. <laughs> I I grew up working on a farm before I was even a teenager. We had to work, and we were working long hours. That's just a part of the life that I was accustomed to. But a summer job can be incredibly beneficial no matter where you are for teenagers. It teaches them responsibility, time management, uh, working with others, teamwork, 
taking instruction from people other than their parents or teachers. Yeah. But when looking for a job, it's going to be important to find something that kind of aligns with their interests and their goals. I know that's easier said than done, that that's not always the case. I mean, our oldest two first jobs were both at Chick-fil-A and that did not align with their job, you know, their goals long term. Interests, well, they like Chick-fil-A, so that was interesting <laughs> to them there, but it was an opportunity for them to learn in a good structured environment about what to do. They were lifeguards. They worked at camps during the summer. So there were a lot of different opportunities we had. So if you can find something that aligns with their goals and stuff, that's fine. But don't get so hung up on it that you just don't get them out there working and doing something. It's going to provide yeah. such valuable lessons for them. Yeah. It could even spark some career interests. Yeah, go ahead. I think you, it's important to find one that's willing to be flexible too, so that you're not spending the entire summer working, but they also have opportunities to do something that really be, builds their character and leadership. And it, it's just something fun to do, yeah. you know, because some jobs are not super flexible. So finding something that is flexible, but maybe something they can continue during the school year, I think is important. You know, and where I grew up, everybody had a summer job. Everybody worked either on their own parents' farm or with someone else's farm or in businesses that were associated with agriculture in some way. Maybe you worked at the grocery store or the local, you know, convenience store or something that was related around it. Everybody did something like that. And for most of us, you know, it, it was it was maybe eight o'clock or earlier till mid-afternoon days. But we learned responsibility. We learned that we had to get up and get things done. We also learned an appreciation for the value of our time off. Mm -hmm. And so when we were off, the activities that we engaged in, we took opportunities to be a lot more with our friends. We've got, you know, and we earned some money. They ain't going to earn a lot of money, but we earned some money. Your kids are going to get paid most likely whatever minimum wages in your area. Some places allow for students for teenagers under 17, I believe, to be paid less than minimum wage. So you might, they're not going to get paid a lot, but they are starting that thing uh, of earning their money, which I think builds a whole lot of responsibility as well. When they get that first check, they get that first payment and they realize this is mine. I earned this. I did this. Yeah. I think it's also their first glimpse into how to work with people and mm -hmm. how complicated people can be. So I think that's, and it, I think it's important too. And the younger they are, the more they might be doing volunteer stuff. And it may be if your church has summer programs for younger children. In the area that I grew up in, in the, in the part of the South that we are, they, they have, most churches have things called vacation Bible st uh, schools, <laughs> which are just two, three hours at the most that kids will come in during a, a week or a few days and have extended Bible study time and fun activities. They're always looking for volunteers to help. So if you got a 14 year old that can't get a job, maybe they go and volunteer for that. Something yeah. that can help them have those types of things. But listen, summer job, yes, go for it. If you yeah. can do it, go for it. Yeah. All right, moving on. Emily in Georgia is asking, how can I help my teenager stay connected with friends and make new ones over the summer? Well, staying connected is probably going to be a lot easier than it was during our era. Because the devices and those things, they're going to be able to stay together. They're going to be texting. They're going to be FaceTiming. They're, they may be, you know, especially in the evenings, if, if you allow them to have access to devices for an extended period of time, they're going to be able to connect. But I think you need to look beyond that. You need to provide in-person connection. Summer is definitely not the time for their entire existence or their entire ability to connect with people be digital. That is totally wrong. We need to yeah. get them beyond that. So they need to find some get-togethers that they have, maybe times to connect at a pool or a sporting event or you know a picnic, a movie night, a day at the beach. I, I don't know if you're, see, you said that, the Emily was from Georgia, so they got beaches there, Some, a lake, you know, something where they can get together physically and get away from the technology, the digital way of connecting. They really need to do that. Places they can meet new folks, these jobs that we're talking about, volunteering that we talk about, 
uh, summer camps that they go to. If you can, if you can get involved with summer camps, that's st- such a viable option. The neighborhood yeah. pool. <laughs> yeah. Healthy yeah. social media guidance, promoting that can help them stay connected, but you really need to limit it. That does not need to be the number one spot. You don't need to be seeing your kids saying, hey, if you talk to your best friend this week, yeah, we, we FaceTime. Now you need to be able to connect. And uh, Emily, I would also suggest too, that you allow some unstructured personal connection time. Some times where they have to get together and they have to figure out, okay, uh, you guys get out of the house and find something to do uh, for the next two hours and figure it out on your own. And leave the devices inside and figure it out. Let them grow outside. Let them do something outside. Yeah. There's always the yeah. joke about those of us who were kids in the 80s that our, our parents didn't know where we were from 1982 to 1989. They had no clue what we were doing most of the time. We need a little bit more of that in life now. All right. Great points. All right. Our next question is from James. He's actually in great New York. Great name, James. Uh, who says, how can I keep my teenager intellectually stimulated without making them feel, wow, like school? Yeah. Well, you brought up one thing. We had those workbooks. Now, I remember there was a local bookstore that we found those workbooks were, and what they were were bridge books. Weren't that, that what they were called? Bridge yeah, books? they were called that. Mm-hmm. Bridge books. So basically, if they were going from third to fourth grade, it was, here's the skills you should have learned in third, and you need to know before you go into fourth. Let's just reinforce them. So having those types of workbooks helped. They weren't difficult. They were very easy, and, she, and, and you didn't have them do, like, a whole bunch. It was just maybe a sheet here or there. So intellectual stimulation doesn't have to come from textbooks. It can be, or workbooks like that, but they can read books a lot during the summer, um, watch documentaries. If if they can find something that that encourages them there, maybe you can get them to take some some online courses in there. We, We sent ours to summer camps that were related to things that they were interested in that not only were physical and fun, you know, outside playtime and fun, but also created, you know, helped them mind-wise. You know, my, my son learned a lot at Boy Scout camp going through merit, merit badges. Uh, our daughter, our youngest daughter last year went to a, what, did she, what was the camp she went to? Songwriting? Oh, yeah. She went to a music songwriting camp. Yeah. So all these types of things, exploring nature, when, whenever we go on vacation, there's a portion of what we do that's exploring something, either nature or historical. There's something aspect of that. And they never have once said this is boring. They've always been like, oh, this is kind of cool. I didn't know about this. So um, yeah, you want yeah. your goal is to make learning just a natural part and an enjoyable part of their summer experience. Not that they're going back to summer school. Do they even have summer school anymore? I know they don't yeah. locally. They do? Okay. No, they do. Yeah, there's. I know people that are working summer school teachers. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. All right. Amanda in Austin says she's curious, what role should I play as a parent in my teenager's summer activities? <laughs> <laughs> well, support and guidance for one, but not detailed planner. Uh, you want to give them the freedom to grow and explore. You might want to be a facilitator rather than a director, someone who helps facilitate these activities, but you don't direct every single activity of it. Let them have the chance to just have the boredom that forces them to be creative, you know, with each other. Offer suggestions, offer resources, but let them take the lead on, on deciding how they want to spend some of their summer activities. If it's jobs, you don't want to go get them a job and come to them and say, hey, Abby, uh, I got you a job. You're going to work here. We've done many times is we've said, hey, we've heard there's jobs at this place here. We talked to somebody that they said, hey, have an open. If you're interested, you go contact them. I don't think we ever, did, we we never for either the oldest two, we never, and it, for reference, our oldest two are 24 and 21. We never got them jobs. Mm-mm. They We no. just told them there were opportunities there and they were, they went and got them on their own, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So your job, Amanda, encourage, support, sometimes giving them a little nudge, but this is a time for them to grow and be independent. And yeah. Any thoughts great you advice. have on that? Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. All right. Finally, we have a question from Robert in Tennessee. He's asking, 
How can I ensure my child's or my teenager's mental well-being during the summer? Well, one thing I want you to do, and I want you to commit to doing this, and I want all of our audience to commit to doing this, is limit their digital time. Mm. Limit their time on devices. That is, we're seeing increasing research done that there is a direct cause on the amount of time that they spend on digital devices and the types of apps that they're on and the types of things they're doing and their mental health. Summer is a time for us to get away from that. Summer is a time for us to put those things away. So we need to have a balance of recreation and engagement, a balance of work and play. We want them to stay active. Uh, maintain kind of a healthy sleep structure. I know a lot of parents that I've heard So all my kid does is stay up all night and sleep all day. Well, that's your fault, mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, you're not, you're not helping them on this, but they need to get off of that. So we, we got to, we got to keep it going with them. Give them a chance to talk about things, uh, share their feelings, share their concerns, uh, recuperate, relax. A healthy yeah. and happy summer is more than just staying busy, really. It's about nurturing the whole person. And you can do this. And and my number one suggestion is going to be limit their digital time. Limit it. Limit it. Limit it. And I'm not just talking devices and apps. I'm talking also about binging Netflix. Limit it. Limit it. That's such great advice. We have more questions coming in. And we have one that is from Jennifer in Colorado. And she's asking, how can I help my teenager develop a healthy sleep routine during the summer? Which, I mean, you kind of already just alluded to that a little bit. Well, I mean, it, it's really crucial for them. Their schedules are relaxed and it's going to be very easy for them to stay up. Now, I didn't have a choice but to have a regular sleep routine because I had to be up and at work by 730 every morning. So I had to do this. So having those activities like a job or like volunteering or something that's going on early in the morning is going to do that. So establishing a routine, say they don't have a job or they don't have a consistent job or they don't have something they're doing every day. Establish a certain time that you say, hey, breakfast in this house has to be finished by 8.30. And whether you like it or not, kitchen's closed after that. Don't come rolling in here. Your bed has to be made. You have to be out of it. It has to be made and done by you know 8.15 or whatever. I'm just throwing out an under. So if you establish in a bedtime routine, Includes winding down activities, reading, listening to music, whatever. Limiting their screen time as much as possible. Early teens, uh, middle schoolers, and and uh, early high schoolers. I would dare say you need to take their digital devices away from them early in the evening to give them. If they're gonna, if you're gonna tell them they have to be asleep by eleven or in their rooms by eleven, which is not uncommon during the summer. I mean that's that's a decent time if they don't have something pressing. Then by eight or nine at the latest, at least two hours, I would say three before they're, they need to be off their do devices. They need to be completely off of it. And I know that goes against, so, oh, they're supposed to be connecting with friends. You talked about that earlier. Well, you know, tell the friends, hey, I can talk to you until seven or eight. And after that, you know, you have to wait till the next day. Yeah. Get them we, off of this. Yeah. Don't hesitate to do that either because. We do that with our youngest child right now, and she's 14. We'll collect her device at 9 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night during the summer, and it stays plugged in in our room. And there's so many parents who are afraid to do that for whatever reason. And I have asked girls that have come over here before because we do that during sleepovers as well so yeah. that they will actually communicate with one another and talk. And nobody has ever bitten my head off for yeah. doing that for their child. And I've asked them, does your mom and dad do this at your house? No, they don't, which is mind blowing to me, but don't hesitate to do it. Well, They're every not, parent, it's it's okay. Melissa, it shouldn't blow our minds. I mean, every parent is thinking that their kid is better and they know yeah. how to handle it better than any of the other kids. So all these reports about how, you know, being on a digital device is causing mental health. Well, that's not going to happen to my Susie and my Johnny. They're different. Right. Okay, let me get this straight. You, who maybe this is your first child, who have never parented before, who are not an expert in this field, who don't research this field, have all of a sudden been blessed with some gift that your child is going to be able to not succumb to a problem that is infecting every other child their age 
in the Western world that has access to these devices. You're going to be the one that has miraculously found this solution. Not that you've researched, but it just popped out of nowhere. No, you don't. It, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. There is uh, the book, The Anxious Generation, which, you know, if you've been following me online, you, you'll see I, I'm promoting that book quite a bit. It says that children should not have smartphones until they're in high school. And should not have access to social media until they're 16 or 17. Yeah. And yeah. as far as I get, they, you got to cut it off. Yeah. Parents, don't be afraid to say no. It's really okay. <laughs> All right. Our next question is from Dave, who is also in Denver. And he's curious, how can I encourage my teenager to explore new interests and hobbies during the summer? Well, there's going to be time. Uh, you can start by discussing with them what they're curious about and have always wanted to try. Uh, it could be anything from learning musical instruments and stuff. If you live in an urban area, uh, if you live in a city like like we do here in Raleigh, North Carolina, there are countless workshops and camps, mini camps that are not overnight camps and they're not even all day. They're like two hours or something. They call it a camp. No, like, okay, whatever. That. You can send them to to learn about photography, learn about musical instruments, learn about songwriting, learn about oh gosh, the the, the thing dance, the, the things are un are endless, uh, yeah. and those are just ones through private organizations that I just mentioned. The city of Raleigh has multiple camps available through their programs that are very very inexpensive that you can yeah. go and do for an hour a day during these time frames. So there's a lot of opportunities for this. Looking for workshops. I'd stay away as much as I possibly could during the summer from an online class. Mm. Even if it's learning something about, I, I just yeah. stay away from it. Yeah. I would do something where they're in person and they have to do it. I, I, I certainly would. I know uh, I have a friend who ran a little fitness camp, you know, teaching folk, kids on fitness, you know, because he wanted to help them with that. So getting them out, letting them learn, Letting them read about it, yeah, but not sit in front of a screen and watch about it. We want to keep that away. This is summer. Yeah, yeah. Decrease the devices because, I mean, if if your kid's like our kid, they use devices all during the school year for school. So yes. get them off of them for the get summer. Get them off of them. Okay. I have another question from Samantha in Charlotte, and she asks, how can I help my teenagers set goals for the summer without overwhelming them? Oh, I'm a big proponent of goal setting. As everyone knows, it's a part of our programs at Generation Youth. And setting goals can be very motivating for a team, but you have to keep it in balance, especially during the summer. You don't want to be so strict on those that they feel like, oh gosh, I'd rather be in school than have to deal with this all the time. So you want to have them you know, have a conversation about what they want to achieve during the summer and help them break that into larger and smaller goals and manageable steps. Like we were talking to our youngest yesterday about the ukulele. She's playing the ukulele. Maybe we look at how the goal this summer can be to increase her skill level on ukulele. Well, let's practice, you know, so many times a week on this or, you know, setting those types of things and and, and engaging and in, in, in playing it for fun at different times. The key is to keep it fun and stress-free. That's the key all the time. But during the summer, we want to have that. We're about to wrap up on our time. We're, I think we're about to run out on time and stuff. But I think one of the crucial things that problems that we see with parenting during the summer is the two extremes. The one extreme of let's be loose and open, no planning, fun, let them hang by the pool all day, do nothing, and we'll go to the beach. And that sounds fun, but it's not stimulating for them. It's not helping them grow. It's just really what you want to do, and you're just letting them tag along. Stop being a lazy parent, and let's get it going. The second <laughs> is the other extreme where we're so structured, where it's so organized, where they're so directed on every minute of the day that it's no longer fun. It's no longer stimulating. There's got to be something in between. There's got to be something in between where you have time to work or volunteer or to engage in some kind of community activities and spend time with your friends with fun and with family fun, while at the same time looking for opportunities to learn different things that you may not have the time to do during a school year. Mm -hmm. Don't plan everything for them and don't let it just be a free-for-all fun time all the time. They got to have 
some structure on that. What are your thoughts on that? Having raised two that are already out of the house and one that's got a few more years left. I would totally agree with what you just said. Again, finding ways to get them out in the community and serve if they're not old enough to work a job yet and giving them that balance. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they want to go to the pool. Definitely let them go to the pool. Spend that time vacationing, but also giving them the opportunity to volunteer or work. That balance between the two gives them rest and relaxation, but also keeps them involved and gives them a different experience than during the school year. And number one thing I said during this, the number one point I want to bring across is get them off those digital devices. Mm -hmm. Get them off of those digital devices. Let them go outside. Let them grow. Let them be involved with nature in some way. There's so much research that shows that not so much research that shows that digital devices are harming us, but there's also so much research that shows that being outside and learning and growing in a free type flowing, having the freedom to explore nature is great for their health. It's great for them. So that's mm. one of the things that we try to do during our vacation time is we try to have some downtime where our kids just have the ability to go out and hike or explore or wander around and just, see what's going on. And that's, we've had to force them out because they want to sit and watch TV or play on their devices. So we've had to force them out to do some of that stuff, but it's advantage to it. Any closing thoughts? No, I think all of this has been great advice or hopefully it's been great advice and answered these questions. If you have any questions, uh, hit us up on social media. Uh, go over to our Instagram page, uh, send us a note, uh, tag us in something so that we can engage on this. I encourage you to look at camps, tag them, follow them, uh, be involved with them, workshops, stuff like that, that your, your community, your city or your community may have. Uh, be involved with this. And if you've stuck with us this long, you, you know the value of having this kind of summer program. Enjoy your summer. Uh, this is going to air the 1st of June of, of 2024. So enjoy this summer. Enjoy the next two and a half months before school kicks back in with these with these young people. You got 10 great weeks ahead of you. Take advantage of them. Take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you for being a part of our show today. Uh, please like, share, and comment on this episode. Most importantly about that is sharing. Someone that you know needs to hear this, needs to have this discussion, and you can help us out to reach them by sharing this episode with them. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be again here next week on another episode of the Generation Youth Podcast.